and welcome to Neat AI. So it's time to speciate, which is the first step in creating the next generation in our exclusive OR solution using Neat and a genetic algorithm. I'm going to cover how individuals are selected for the species they're assigned to, how gene innovation IDs play into this, how and why the compatibility threshold varies in each generation, and why the target number of species we're trying to create doesn't always match up with the number of species that appear. In the last video, we looked at the key elements and components of our class, which we'll use to create our population. So the first step in creating the next generation is the speciation process. At a high level, here's what's occurring. As it's generation zero, I select one population member at random and make it the first member of species one. I then compare each member of the population with this network and this comparison returns a positive number. This number gets compared to a threshold value and if it's below it, then that population member is assigned to species one. Otherwise, it remains unassigned for now. Once all members have been checked, species one is complete. Of the remaining population members, I select another one at random and that becomes the first member of species 2 and also the template for comparison purposes. And again, I compare each member of the population with this network and if this comparison result is below the threshold value, then the population member is assigned to species 2 and so on. And this continues until all the population members have been assigned to a species. And it's quite common as the generations go by to have a species with only one member. And you can define rules on what to do if this happens when it comes to the crossover stage. So with everyone assigned to a species, let's just rewind to take a closer look at that comparison check. When you compare two networks, you're doing it on the basis of their topological and weight similarities. The compatibility difference will be zero for networks that are identical in every way. And as mutations make their way into the population, you'll see the network shapes getting more and more different. So we compare just three things. First is the excess genes, followed by the non-excess genes between the networks, and finally the average weight differences between connections that are common to both networks. Note that this is an absolute value, so it'll always be positive. And when we're comparing connections, we're only looking at enabled connections. In this example, network B is the species 1 champion, and we're going to compare network A with network B to see if network A belongs in species 1. The start of this comparison is driven by the innovation IDs assigned to each connection. Remember that identical connections will have identical innovation IDs, so it's easy to match up connections between the two networks. If we focus on the excess connections, I can see that network A doesn't have any, so that's a zero, and network B has two, with innovation IDs of 34 and 36. These are considered to be excess because their innovation IDs exist outside the range of innovation IDs in network A, which only go from 1 to 29. Disjoint connections are next, and I can see that both networks have three, the definition here being connections that don't exist in the other network, but reside within the innovation ID range of the other network. N is equal to 11, which is the total number of enabled connections in the larger network, whichever one that happens to be. More on that in a moment. And finally, the weight comparison. Here we sum up the absolute difference between the weights on connections that belong in both networks and get the average. Bringing all of that together gives you a value of 20.2, and that's a valid comparison check between the two networks. If you simply stop here and have a dynamic threshold enabled, which will steer the number of species produced towards your preferred species target, you would use this to check if network A belonged to the same species as network B. By the way, Ken stopped here and didn't implement the other elements he writes about in his paper around normalization and scaling coefficients when he coded his own exclusive or solution, which is detailed on his website. We can certainly complicate things now by normalizing for genome size by dividing E and D by N, which will give us a different value for the compatibility difference between the networks. And taking that final step of introducing the coefficients C1, C2 and C3 aligns us with the original solution proposed in the published paper. These are used to allow us to adjust the importance of the three factors and the values set here are the original ones from the paper. I've always used method 3 as I like the idea of being able to play around with the coefficients, but all three methods are valid. You'll just need a different threshold cutoff value to meet your species target objective. Here we can see that with a compatibility difference of 5.6, network A does not belong in species 1. So all population members at this stage have both their species and fitness fields set, and it's time to determine how many offspring each species can produce. To help with this, we're now going to introduce another field called adjusted fitness, which is simply the fitness value divided by the size of the member's species. In the example shown, species 2 has 8 members, so its size is 8, and all species 2 members will divide their fitness by 8 to get their adjusted fitness. All species 1 members will divide their fitness by 5, 
and Species 3 members will simply divide it by 2. To start with, I'm going to work out the average fitness for each species. So Species 1 has 5 members with an average fitness of 6. Species 2 has 8 members with an average fitness of 7.9. And Species 3 has 2 members with an average fitness of 5. And the entire population has a fitness average of 6.9. And the offspring allowed by a species is given by the formula shown. When I work it out, we can see that species 1 can produce 5, which is the same as it had. Species 2 will grow by 1 to 9, and species 3 will drop from 2 to just 1. It's important to realize that species 2 is both the fittest and has the most members, and it's going to get even bigger in the next generation. So there's a risk that a successful species will dominate the population and restrict the opportunities smaller species have to explore their own niches. So Ken decided this wasn't the way to go, preferring instead to use the adjusted fitness to work things out. So if we swap out fitness for adjusted fitness and work out the new global adjusted fitness average, we can see the impact it has on the offspring produced. Species 2 will drop from 8 to 6, while species 3 can breathe a little, growing from 2 to 4. With this approach, a species can't afford to become too big, even if many of its organisms perform well. Ken details this clearly in his paper. So with speciation complete, it's now time to produce the next generation by selecting two parents from within a species and performing the crossover function. So if you're interested in seeing that, you know what to do. As always, thanks for watching.